Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I know I talk on my channel about books all the time and what I think of new releases, what I think of the new books that I read, but I don't really have a video on my channel with just my favorite books of all time. Like I have a video about books that changed my life, my favorite fantasy books, and of course there's a lot of overlap there, but I just wanted to have a video on this channel with my current favorite books of all time. And I think you should read them too if you want. To me, picking favorite books is so difficult because I could easily talk to you about like recent faves, but I never know which favorites are gonna stick around for long enough that they become all-time favorites. And some of my older favorites, I'm kind of afraid that if I were to read them now, I might not love them as much as then. So then I'm also a little bit hesitant of calling them all-time favorites. Sometimes I give a book five stars because I loved it in the moment, but it doesn't become a favorite because it just kind of fades away over time. This is a list of books that didn't fade away. Hello, we are interrupting your program to talk about today's sponsor, Nordgren. This Danish watch company makes classic minimalist watches that could be adorning your wrist today. Wait, I'm sorry, do I hear that correctly? They're not just pretty and beautiful for that dark academia aesthetic, they are also sustainable and ethically made. Want to see how good sustainable can look? I'm currently wearing their unisex model, the philosophy design. I chose a gold dial and a black leather strap, but I got this one in a bundle with an extra brown leather strap, so I can easily switch things up whenever I want. They also have a bunch of other great designs on their website, so make sure to check those out as well. Want to hear a secret? I wear this watch every day. I do not leave the house without it. I don't think I could do a day without this watch. Now let's move on to our new segment with today a list of all the ways that Nordgreen makes sure that they are sustainable and ethical. First off, they use sustainable packaging made of upcycled plastic bottles and FSC certified cartons. They use carbon neutral shipping partners and plant thousands of trees to offset carbon emissions generated by the office in Copenhagen. And last but not least, they donate to three global NGOs Water for Good, Pretham UK, and Cool Earth. In 2020, North Green donated 33,000 months of education, 64,000 months of clean water, and protected 900,000 square meter of rainforest. Now that's a watch I can get behind. If you also want to look classy, you can get 15% off your watch if you use my code BOOKLEO or click the link in the description. That's a 15% additional discount on top of the already 20% discount of bundles. So click the link in the description and check it out. Thank you Nordgreen for sponsoring this video. Now back to our regular program. If you were to ever ask me to pick one favorite book, I would just die on the spot because I'd rather die than pick a favorite. There's a lot. I think there's like 11 books on here. <laughs> Clearly, I can't pick any favorites. The first one that I want to talk about is one that I've talked about. All of these I've talked about a lot on this channel, to be honest. Let's just start with an all-time favorite that I really need to reread someday soon. And that is A Vicious by Victoria Swab. Oh, this book. So imagine this. There's a book about two academic rival slash best friend who have this hypothesis that if you have a near-death experience, you might develop some superpowers. And of course, as the absolute geniuses that these students are, they try it out on themselves. Which obviously leads to complications. <laughs> Fast forward 10 years, they do have superpowers, but they are now each other's mortal enemies and they're doing everything to kill each other. That's some conflict right there. The whole idea of the story is that we have a main character who really sees himself as the villain and an antagonist who sees himself as a hero. So it's kind of like flipped from what you were used to. An anti-hero main character, Victor, who really does a lot of like ethically ambiguous things. And we have an antagonist with a god complex, which I, I, for some reason, I really like antagonists like that. There are people with special abilities, kind of like X-Men style, which is one of my favorite types of magic systems. And this book just has my favorite trope of all time, which is academic rivals turned enemies. And I blame watching too much Naruto as a teen on that. <laughs> But the thing is, I have like, I think I've consumed like 
three pieces of media in my lifetime with that trope like the academic rivals to enemies and I need more of it like I need like people are always like found family enemies to lovers chosen one I just want academic rivals to enemies like uh, it just does something to me I can't explain it's so full of angst it makes me want to cry in like the best way possible. If any of my gushing sounds good to you, then I highly recommend this one. Then we have a new edition. Let me just grab the different books in the series together that are now like splayed out into a pile. Newest addition to this list is the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. The first book being the fifth season. Oh, I remember reading these last year like in quarantine when it was super, super hot in here and I could only sit on the balcony because everywhere else was way too hot and I was just reading these books and oh, good times, good times. Anyway, <laughs> if you take sci-fi and fantasy and you put them together, you just get something wonderful that is this series. It's a post-apocalyptic fantasy country where once every few hundred years, there is something called a fifth season, which is just kind of like a mini apocalypse where the land is just ravaged by natural disasters, earthquakes, etc. And in this world there are also people with magical abilities and in this world, like, oh, it's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. The magic system is like seismic magic so people can create earthquakes and it's very it's a very hard magic system very scientific, very specific rules. It's unlike any magic system I've ever read and it's Chef's kiss. And in the fifth season, you follow three female perspectives and how they're kind of dealing with this new fifth season that is coming and how they are learning to use their magic. The thing about this book is that it's it's like one big mystery. Just the moment you start reading, you're just like, what is going on? I don't understand this. Why are there flying gems in the sky? Why are, what are these rock people? Why are there these bottomless pits that just seem to go to the center of the earth. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> and what I really like about this book is that it's super theme heavy. It very heavily deals with themes of oppression, discrimination, rewriting history, motherhood, beautifully woven into this like adventure story. I would say that this book is absolutely something for you if you would like sci-fi fantasy crossover and if you like stories that are just kind of like one big mystery where just slowly things unfold. Also if you really like unique world building and magic systems, I will say that one of the perspectives in this book is in second person. So instead of I or he, it is you did this, you saw this. And I know that for a lot of people that can be a real deal breaker. Personally, I got used to it pretty easily. So I wouldn't be too intimidated by it. Definitely give it a try. But I do know that for some people that can really be a reason to just not get through this series. So just a heads up. But other than that, I need, every I need everyone to read these books. <laughs> okay, then I just want to quickly talk about a few oldie books that were my favorites back in the day when I was a teenager but I still want to put them on this list because they are special to me and I still appreciate them even though I'm 23 years old right now. The first one is of course The Hunger Games by Susan Collins but before you like sigh and go away and like uh, just another person that liked The Hunger Games because it was like the first book they ever read and of course they liked it. it I need to put on like my Hunger Games defense hat. I am personally the Hunger Games defense squad. I will defend this book till my death and tell you about how fantastic it is. I will fight everyone who thinks that this is just a shallow, silly teen book that's only popular because teen girls like it. The Hunger Games is genuinely good political commentary. Not only is it a critique of the horrors and childishness of war, it is also a critique of how the people in power capital in this case, will pit like oppressed people against each other to divert the attention from like the real oppressor. And no, not just because they literally have to fight each other to the death in the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games books are filled with like more subtle but super accurate little details that allude to the sting of how the people are kept from standing up against the capital but instead just hate on each other. I mean the climax of the story is literally Katniss 
refusing to let the capital put her and Peter up against each other because she knows she knows that the capital doesn't want the people watching to realize that they are the real bad guys after all okay Candace Everdeen was gaining class consciousness in 2008 and we are not talking about it but that's not all not only is the Hunger Games like a genuine good critique on political stuff as good dystopians are it is also like a perfect representation of how dystopian society feels to teenagers constant feeling of being perceived having to think about who you are and how you want to present yourself to the world anti-authoritarian themes it perfectly fits puberty just because something appeals to the teenage experience doesn't make it less meaningful you just don't understand it because you're 31 years old hank I think that's enough of me ranting about the Hunger Games. Wow, okay, let's move on to another quick old favorite of mine that I want to give some special attention, and that is Angel Fall by Susan E. Just another one of those dystopians that I read back in the day, but this one was just, it, it just hit different. And no, not because the apocalyptic element of it was just hot angels attacking the earth. It was snarkier. It subverted a lot of common dystopian tropes that I'd seen so far. The main character was not a chosen one. It had horror and gore elements in a way that I haven't seen in any other YA dystopian and I really liked that. I really found out that that's kind of a thing. I feel like there's some butterfly effect going on that started with me reading Angel Fall at 15 years old and has now ended in me loving Ninth House at 22 years old. Like, there's some, some, hmm something happened there. Now Ninth House is not on my list of favorites even though I do love it I feel like I need to read a little bit more in the series before I can officially say that it's one of my favorites but I do have another Lee Bardugo book on this list. Of course none of you are surprised that Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo remains one of my favorite books of all time. I really thought this was just gonna be one of those books that I loved when I was 18 and would not love today, but I recently reread it and I still loved it, guys. I still loved it. <laughs> this is the famous heist YA fantasy. It takes place in 18th century, 17th century historical Amsterdam. <laughs> we follow a band of thieves, swindlers, thugs that go on this heist to break out and also first break in <laughs> a highly highly secure prison. It has the found family trope, it has a massive emphasis on the characters and their backstories and their relationships to each other. It has good banter, it has angst, so much angst which I know isn't everyone's thing, but I do like it. I think this book was like my first introduction into having slightly more morally ambiguous main characters. And upon reread, I definitely see that these characters were really not that morally gray. <laughs> but at the time that I read this, this was just so different from the usual goody two shoes. Oh my God, the worst thing I'd ever done is turn down the losing end of the love triangle main character. <laughs> and that was just really a breath of fresh air for me. And that fresh air being main characters who rip out other people's eyes. <laughs> Usually I really love books that heavily focus on characters and I also like it if my char main characters are just like a little bit more morally gray. And I figured it out by reading this book. Then next up we have actually a contemporary book. Um, yes, I know, surprise. Usually I don't like contemporary books, especially not why contemporary books because I feel like I'm kind of old enough to the point that they tend to not really be relatable to me anymore and I especially don't like YA contemporaries that don't have romance because the only reason I usually read contemporary books is for the romance and yet on this list we have a YA contemporary without any romance that I still absolutely adored and that is Radio Silence by Alice Oseman. Despite all the things I just said and this not seeming like the book for me, I decided to just give it a try and listen to the audiobook and I started listening to it and I just couldn't stop listening. I just wanted someone to inject this story straight into my veins. I needed all of it. I was immediately addicted. The plot is not really the point of this story, it's how it's executed that makes this so wonderful. I think this book is genuinely the best rendition of 
teenage insecurities about yourself and your future that I've ever seen. Like the kind of insecurities that you still have, that still linger even when you're an adult, but are kind of at its height at the end of high school or secondary school. And it is one of the most authentic written contemporary YA pieces that I've ever read. Like it just feels so so real to the point that even though I am older now I can still really relate to it and it still feels well auth auth authentic. <laughs> On top of that this book explores themes of fandom, sexuality, friendship, family, being biracial, not knowing what you want to do with your future, like kind of the difference between what people expect of you and the kind of person that you've always been so far and the person that maybe you want to actually be. This story just really spoke to me in many different ways. Really wonderful and I would recommend this to formerly gifted burnout kids. <laughs> then back to YA. We have another one of my new favorite series. Uh, the, only the first two in the series are out yet but I'm still gonna put it on my favorite list and that is the Guild of Wolves series by Roshni Chokshi. So completely unexpectedly I just decided to pick up this book. I heard that it took place in like 18th century Paris, that it had a found family trope and that there was a heist involved. So I was like, that sounds cool. Let me just, let me just pick that up, see what it's all about. And it was just one of those books where you read the first chapter and you just immediately know this is gonna be a five-star read. Like that's one of the best feelings ever. You just know this is my thing. If you were to ever ask, ask me like, what's your thing? You know, what what's really your thing in YA fantasy? I would just point you to this book. We have a cast of fantastically lovable, unique characters. Although I will say that the characters don't really shine and develop until book two. It's also super diverse. We follow main characters with all kinds of different sexualities and backgrounds. And it's exactly the type of fun adventure that I want from a YA fantasy. Like the characters constantly need to solve these riddles and puzzles to get through like their heist and that oh oh my gosh that makes me so happy. <laughs> Look riddles puzzles there's this really strong focus on kind of like the balance between science and more magic and myth and I'm a big nerd that gets really excited about that. And the thing is I have a hard time recommending this book because I know that a lot of people just end up don't really liking it and I still haven't figured out what makes it so that some people really don't care about this book and other people absolutely adore it. Um, but I've done my best so I've compiled a small list of things that I think if you like these things then you will also like this book. The first thing is if you're okay with a somewhat convoluted magic system that doesn't have a lot of rules and just takes a little bit of time to intuitively understand. Second, if you get excited about <laughs> solving riddles and puzzles. Also, if you get excited about stories that grasp from a lot of different myths and religions. And of course, also if you get excited about the found family trope, because that one makes me excited every time and it's in this one. <laughs> then next up, I have to put my favorite classic on this list. And of course, if there's one classic that a fantasy lover like me has as their favorite it has to be the one classic that has a speculative element to it and that is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. I should really like look back on these tabs one day. So we have our main character Dorian Gray. He's beautiful, gorgeous, loved by everyone. If he lived today he would be a TikTok star. Dorian Gray would be like the male Bella Porch, no doubt. But he's not just gorgeous, he's also a little bit naive, very easily influenced by the people in his life. Then someone makes a portrait of him and it's not just any portrait, because the thing with this portrait, something that Dorian starts to notice over time is that the portrait slowly gets older, but he, Dorian Gray, remains young and Dorian Gray just becomes obsessed with this painting of himself where he can see himself growing older whereas in reality he's remaining young and he can keep up this love that everyone has for him and he just becomes obsessed with making sure that no one ever gets to see this painting, no one finds out what is going on, he needs to make sure that he stays young forever. What I love about this book is that it's basically a corruption arc, you know, usually you have like a, a redemption arc or just like a character development arc. Here it's just 
Dorian slowly losing it. <laughs> and it is wonderfully done and wonderfully set up. Also another thing that I really like about this book is we have these characters just just having conversations with each other often about all sorts of interesting topics and ideas which was very fun to read. It's beautifully like lyrically written so who would I recommend this for? Even though this book has no romance although the debatable I would recommend this book to hopelessly romantic people. <laughs> it just has those like romantic vibes, you know? I don't know, is this, does this book fit into like the romantic era? Like any English majors? Explain that to me. <laughs> then we have a new favorite book. This is a book of which I wasn't really sure if it was gonna be on the all-time favorite list because it's definitely a recent favorite, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's gonna stand the test of time and it's gonna remain a favorite over time. Like it's gonna be a recent favorite turning into an all-time favorite. And that is The Night Circus because I am not original and everyone has this book as their favorite book. But it's just really worth the hype. But I also know that this book isn't gonna be for everyone, so I'm gonna do my best while gushing over this book to kind of give you an idea of if you would like this or not. So, synopsis of this book. That's already the hard part. <laughs> just follow this magical circus that appears out of nowhere at night, where people have real magic, but of course the, the real-life people don't know that, they just think, whoa, that's a really good magic trick. <laughs> but it's actually magic. And we follow many characters in and around this circus, like a little boy that discovers the circus, the creator of the circus, the performers at the circus, and at the heart of it, the two magicians, at the most powerful magicians at the circus, who are in a contest with each other, a magical contest. But the kicker is that they don't really know what the contest is or what the point is and when it ends. And of course, they fall in love with each other. But I would say I would describe this book as not a romance novel, but a love story. The difference between that to me is that it's not a romance novel because it's not about the, like it's not supposed to be super romantic and like lovey-dovey and cutesy, that it's not written to be like that. It's just a wonderful story with these two characters at the heart of it and how their relationship influences the other characters and how the story unfolds. Yes, the story doesn't really have a very strong plot line and it also doesn't really go deep into the characters or anything, but I just kept reading first that for two reasons. Firstly, because of the mystery element. The whole circus is just shrouded in mystery. This contest is shrouded in mystery. And I kept reading because I just wanted to know what was going on and where all these characters would end up. And secondly, despite there not being a lot of plot or character development, I kept reading because of just how captivating and atmospheric the story is. This book perfectly captures the feeling of going to a circus or like a theater show. There's no real plot, there's no real characters, but you're just mesmerized. Every evening that I picked up this book from my nightstand to read, it felt like I was putting a ticket in a slot to go on this like new Disney park ride. <laughs> I've talked in uh, enough weird metaphors now. <laughs> Let me just say it like this, you could spend 40 euros on like a theater show or you could spend like 15 euros on this book that will give you hours and hours of the same experience. All right and the last book that I want to talk about that's one of my favorites of all time is a non-fiction book that I don't have a physical copy of because I lend it out to a friend and I say that every time that I talk about this book so I should probably ask the book back. <laughs> but it is The Tao of Pooh by Benjamin Hoff. This is technically non-fiction but it really reads like a fiction book. What this is essentially is Taoism, like the concept of Taoism, explained through Winnie the Pooh. Because apparently Winnie the Pooh is like an icon of Tao is living. And the story is basically the author of the book having conversations with Winnie the Pooh and through these conversations they explain these Taoist principles in a really interesting and very clear to understand way. And I'm not a Taoist by any means, I just think it's really interesting because the ideas that are presented in this book are so just like 
diametrically opposed to like the western religion of productivity that exists here so this book really feels like a breath of fresh air to me this time not because people's eyes are being ripped out but just because it's wholesome <laughs> like for example this book goes into the merits of simplicity not having to overcomplicate everything not forcing anything going with the flow etc and i reread this book every one or two years and every time i reread it i kind of get something new out of it and those are like the best kind of books that you can just reread over and over again and learn something new about yourself about the world every single time so i highly recommend this one it's super short it's so easy to read and i really think that it would just be you know just like a great addition to everyone's life you just think about things in a little bit of a different way than what you're used to oh man i just get so happy like talking about all of these books. Leave in the comment down below your favorite book of all time. I understand how painful it would be to just pick one so you can pick multiple. <laughs> Maybe you've seen that we have a similar taste in books, then don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss any of my other videos and like this video because it helps the video out. Um, you can follow me on social media if you want to see more of me on Instagram and Twitter and I will see you soon in another video. Goodbye!